There's probably not a single filmmaker alive who doesn't regret at least something about every single one of their movies, even if they might not publicly state as such. But every so often a filmmaker actually speaks vocally about their perceived failings during production, expressing outright regret for at least a single scene in one of their movies. And the horror genre seems to invite an especially outspoken rabble of creatives, who have freely discussed what they hate about their own films, to the extent that they wish things were totally different in one scene in particular. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie with What Culture, here with 10 horror movie scenes filmmakers regret. Number 10. Randy's Death, Screen 2 Perhaps the single most divisive moment in the entire Scream franchise is the death of fan-favourite film nerd Randy Meeks in the second movie. It's a majorly surprising moment given both Randy's genre savviness and the fact that it occurs in broad daylight, with Ghostface dragging him into Joel's news van and gutting him from end to end. Much as the scene continues to be a bummer for fans, it also is a sore point for the writer Kevin Williamson, who in retrospect believes that he may have offed Randy a little prematurely. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter last year, he said, The very second that Dewey lived in Scream 1, it was RIP for Randy in Scream 2, because we had to kill a legacy. We had to kill someone that was involved with Scream 1, and that was done halfway through so that we could up the stakes. I also wanted to upset the audience and make them mad at the killer. But had I known now that these movies were going to live forever and that they were going to go on, I do think that there was a lot more life left in the character. So I'd love to have seen him as an adult. I'd love to see what he became. I'd love to see how he turned his love of horror films into a career. I'd love to see what his trauma was like after surviving, but unfortunately, I killed him. Number 9. The Twist – High Tension on just about any list of terrible horror movie plot twists, Alexandra Aja's high tension will at least get an honourable mention. Aja's gut-wrenchingly brutal slasher flick collapses completely in the third act when it's revealed that the male trucker serial killer stalking protagonists Marie and Alexia doesn't actually exist. Rather, the killer is Marie herself, with the trucker simply being a dissociated personality in her mind. It's an absolute clangor of a twist that's needlessly thrown into the mix in the final 10 minutes and causes the movie to implode in on itself through its lack of internal logic. But director and co-writer Aja wasn't a fan of the scene either, for while the twist was always in the script, his original version was considerably more modest, yet a producer ultimately forced him to make it more involved. In an interview with Chud.com, he said, The first draft of the script, the script we wanted to do, had the same twist but just in the final minutes. You started the movie in the hospital room and she's telling the story, and then you come back to the hospital room in the end, so you have the feeling that the killer was the killer, but then the doctor brought a VCR into the room, watching the security video from the gas station, and you realise she axes the guy. That was the final twist, and the twist was only saying, OK, what you saw was her vision of the story and the truth is another movie. The producer unfortunately asked us to give up the last scene in the last reel, and I think that's where everything became more fragile. I understand the question of the viewers with the twist coming that way, which is not like the perfect way to bring it. I regret that we didn't have the time or the budget to shoot the two different endings and be able to, at least on the DVD, have the two different endings. While it certainly sounds like Aja's original version of the ending would have been better, placing less emphasis on the big reveal by saving it for the movie's final seconds. Number 8. The Angry Molesting Tree – The Evil Dead One of the most iconic and memorable scenes in The Evil Dead involves the presence of the so-called Angry Molesting Tree, a possessed tree which goes on to sexually assault protagonist Ash's sister, Cheryl. It's a shocking scene which many fans consider jarring, and even filmmaker Sam Raimi himself has expressed regret over the sequence. He told the San Diego Reader in 2012, I do regret it. I think it was unnecessarily gratuitous and a little too brutal. And finally, because people were offended in a way that I didn't, my goal is not to offend people. It is to entertain, thrill, scare, make them laugh, but not to offend them. But you know, I know that a lot of 19-year-olds that are stealing cars and murdering people. Not to make that comparison, but I think my judgement was a little wrong at that time. Yet despite Raimi's comments, the tree rape scene still reappeared in the Raimi-produced 2013 remake, with director Fede Alvarez claiming that an unnamed producer forced him to include it in the script. Hmm. Number 7. The CGI Thing – The Thing 2011 
2011's The Thing prequel came and went without making much of a dent with critics or fans alike, and one of the movie's biggest bugbears was the underwhelming use of CGI instead of practical effects, which are of course one of the hallmarks of John Carpenter's 1982 original. Yet the director originally did shoot the film with practical monster effects, but negative test screenings prompted Universal to replace the in-camera effects, which test audiences said made it look like an 80s movie, with CGI. In a recent interview with Sci-Fi, however, the director revealed that he regrets not putting his foot down with the studio to retain the practical effects. He said, Looking back, we were caught in a cross zone where animatronics were old-fashioned and the CGI wasn't good enough. We made the wrong decision to do it in post-production when it came to making the monster design in the computer. I regret that now. While the decision was ultimately out of the director's hand, given that most discussions about the prequel comes back to the disappointing effects work, you can't blame him for regretting how it all turned out. Number 6. Elise's Death – Insidious the first insidious climax is with the death of psychic Elise, who director James Wan and writer Lee Wanell evidently didn't expect to become the movie's breakout character. As a result, Lin Shay was summoned back to reappear in each of the four sequels to date, whether through supernatural means or flashbacks. And so, to the surprise of no one, Wanell confirmed back in 2018 that he regretted killing Elise at the end of the first movie. He told ABS-CBN News, She died in the first movie, so it's not something where I could pick up from the first movie and continue with the adventures of Elise. I know I made a big mistake. What is wrong with me? In the very least, Insidious's supernatural nature has made it a little easier to keep the fan favourite Elise around, in turn giving Lin Shay the most iconic role of her entire storied career. Number 5. The Sequel Bait Ending – A Nightmare on Elm Street a Nightmare on Elm Street is a fantastic film with a slightly iffy ending, where Nancy Thompson seemingly defeats Freddy Krueger, wakes up the next morning and finds her dead friends alive once again. At that moment, their car is then hijacked by Freddy before Nancy's mother is dragged through her front door window by him, realised with an outrageously unconvincing dummy. Yet, Wes Craven has gone on the record to confirm that his original ending was totally unambiguous, concluding with Nancy concretely defeating Freddy and heading to school the next day. In an interview with Vulture shortly before his 2015 death, he regretted that he agreed to change the ending, giving it a sequel hook at the behest of producer Bob Shea, brother of Insidious star Lin Shea, by the way. He said, Bob wanted a hook for a sequel. I felt that the film should end when Nancy turns her back on Freddy and his violence. That's the one thing that kills him. Bob wanted to have Freddy pick up the kids in a car and drive off, which reversed everything I was trying to say. It suddenly presented Freddy as triumphant. I came up with a compromise, which was to have the kids get in the convertible, and when the roof comes down, we'd have Freddy's red and green stripes on it. Do I regret changing the ending? I do, because it's the one part of the film that isn't me. Number 4. Buffalo Bill's Characterization – The Silence of the Lambs Despite being one of the few films in history to win the Big Five Awards at the Oscars – Best Picture, Director, Actor, Actress and Screenplay – The Silence of the Lambs is far from a universally beloved movie. Ever since its release, LGBT commenters have criticised the film for its portrayal of cross-dressing serial killer Buffalo Bill, feeling that his portrayal contributed to a popular association between the LGBT community and violent psychopathic deviancy. And prior to his death, director Jonathan Demme spoke extensively about the criticism, noting that he wished he'd clarified Gum's presentation in the movie. He told the Daily Beast, This is my directorial failing in making The Silence of the Lambs, that I didn't find ways to emphasise the fact that Gum wasn't gay, but more importantly, that his whole thing is that Lecter's profile on Gum was that he was someone who was terribly abused as a child, and as a result of the abuse he suffered as a child, had extreme self-loathing, and whose life had become a series of efforts to not be himself anymore. When the film was accused of continuing a history of stereotypical negative portrayals of gay characters, that was a wake-up call for me as a filmmaker, and as a person. My gay friends who loved Silence of the Lambs, including my friend Juan Botas, who was one of the inspirations for Philadelphia, said, You can't imagine what it's like to be a 12-year-old gay kid, and you go to the movies all the time, and whenever you see a gay character, they're either a ridiculous comic relief caricature or a demented killer. It's very hard growing up gay and being exposed to all these stereotypes. Types. And that registered with me in a big way. Number 3. Your Soul, Annabelle Creation 
Annabelle prequel, Annabelle Creation, was a huge improvement over its predecessor for the most part, but there's one scene that just falls horribly, hilariously flat when young Janice is tormented by the demonic entity, which has assumed the guise of the human Annabelle who died years prior. Janice approaches Annabelle, asking her what she needs, at which point Annabelle turns around, sporting a digitally demonic face which resembles a NAF Snapchat filter, and bellows, YOUR SOUL. It's totally laughable and impossible to take seriously, and even director David F. Sandberg agrees. Speaking on the Reddit discussion for the film, he revealed, Yeah, I never quite got that one right, and I think of I'll swallow your soul every time I see it. If I could redo it, I'd make the makeup creepier and have her not say anything. Or at least whisper the line instead of full-on demon voice. We tried so many variations of that voice during post. Maybe if we make the voice really overwhelming, that might take away from the cheese. No. Number 2. Jigsaw's Death, Saw 3 In a different universe, Saw 3 could have been the end of the hit horror franchise, bringing it to a close with a tight trilogy, given that it kills off not only Jigsaw himself, but also his accomplice Amanda. Yet Saw 3 ended up being the highest grossing of the first three movies and remains the most commercially successful film in the entire series, enough that the producers unsurprisingly decided to keep the franchise going. We're now up to Saw X in 2023, or Saw X, and the subsequent sequels have bent over backwards to prolong Jigsaw's presence in the story despite his death, liberally featuring him in flashbacks, introducing numerous additional apprentice characters, and most recently making straight-up prequel movies. It's clear to many fans that the series killed off Jigsaw way too early, and it's certainly a sentiment shared by franchise producer Mark Berg, who in a recent IndieWire interview confirmed as such, saying, If I had to do it again, I might not have killed Tobin Bell in Saw 3. That might have been a mistake. Considering the increasingly silly narrative gymnastics the series has deployed to keep him in the movies ever since, you can't really blame the guy. Number 1. Beth's Slanted Apartment, Cloverfield In the case of found footage film Cloverfield, director Matt Reeves doesn't so much regret a single scene, but the execution of said scene. Late in the film, Rob and the other surviving characters make the treacherous journey to the apartment of Rob's girlfriend, Beth. Amid the chaos of the monster's invasion, Beth's apartment building is now tilted to one side, and on the movie's DVD commentary, Reeves said that he was disappointed that most viewers simply believed the sequence was achieved by tilting the camera. In actual fact, production designer Martin Wist had a slanted set built which proved physically gruelling for the cast to navigate. Reeves has stated that if he had another chance to shoot the scene, he would have filmed it in a way which emphasised that the cast were indeed on a real sloped set. Either way, it's still a neat scene, but the man's perfectionism is laudable. And that concludes our list. Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there, and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Littlechild. I've been Ellie with What Culture. I hope you have a magical day, and I'll see you real soon.